Good evening. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We really appreciate you turning up. Um, welcome to the first ever uh, annual, we hope, Christmas lecture, Christmas science lecture. Um, earlier this year, I went on a, a trip to the Royal Institution in London, and while I was there, I got to visit the Faraday Lecture Hall, where every year at Christmas time, Royal Institution put on a, a Christmas lecture to wow and excite um, children. And the first person to do that was a man named Michael Faraday back in the early 1800s. Uh, and his desire was to, to engage the public in science in a way that had never been done before. Very great Michael Faraday there um, giving the first ever Christmas lecture. Um, when I was stood in that very lecture hall there, it's modernised since the one you saw in the video, I felt the ghosts of scientists long gone who had delivered Christmas lectures and I, I sat and I thought, I want to do something like that here. Okay, that was my inspiration. So our setting is far less grand, okay, unfortunately, <coughs> and our scale are a wee bit smaller. But our, but our aim is the same. We want to wow young children and adults uh, about science and make them passionate about it and excited about when you come up to senior school and you come up to Crestwood in the future and, and you get to do and try some of these things that we're going to show you tonight. Now, when I came back and I mentioned this to my team, the first thing they said is, are you crazy? And then I, I, I sort of agreed that we would do it. And, and um, we just thought, well, what theme are we going to do? And there was actually only ever going to be one choice for our first Christmas lecture because we're all big movie geeks. So, you know, we love romance, we love comedy, we love action, but obviously being scientists, we absolutely love science fiction movies. So, tonight's title is called Science in the Movies, okay, and we're going to take you on a tour of some of our favourite films and some science experiments and demonstrations themed around those movies. Okay, well, I hope you enjoy the show. Now, don't know about all of you lot, but I love that film. Carl Fredrickson was such an inspiration to me. He made me want to like to fill up all those helium balloons and make my house fly off to Paradise Cove. Wouldn't that be lovely? Oh yes, oh yes. But it made me think, how did Carl choose the gases to fill those balloons? Does anybody know? What gas you fill up your party balloons with to make them soar? Uh, helium. Helium, fantastic. Now, helium okay. is brilliant because it's nice and light. Okay, you can see this balloon here floating on top of my ruler. But, so at the end of that clip, he starts flying in thunder and lightning. It made me wonder, what happens to all those balloons if they get struck by the lightning? So, should we have a little bit of a look? My lovely assistant, please. There you go. Now, you all know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> bit of a pop. Thank you very much. That's not exactly going to be very good for Carl's house, is it? But there is actually another gas that he could have used actually even lighter than the helium. But for health and safety reasons, we're only allowed a little bit of it in this, because if we filled it up much more, it would actually fly away with my ruler. So we've got a little bit of another gas in here. This gas is called hydrogen. Now, everybody, can you please cover your ears for this one? Did that make anybody jump? Yeah. <laughs> it made a few people jump. I didn't think it was going to go there to start off with. It usually goes a lot faster than that. But as you saw, our hydrogen balloon is a lot more reactive than our helium balloon. It made a much bigger bang, didn't it? Yeah. And it made a big flame as well. So if one balloon does that when it gets hot, what about when it goes into all of that, ele all of that lightning? All of them are going to pop. And then Paul Carl is going to crash down in his house and he will never get to fulfill his adventure. So that is why Carl Fredrickson used helium and not the lighter gas, which is hydrogen. Thank you very much. Jurassic Park, one of my all-time absolute favourite movies. I adore it. I was 
about 11, 12 when it came out, and I was obsessed. I think I've had my dad to take me to the cinema maybe 10 times to see that film. Absolutely love it. It actually inspired a passion in me for dinosaurs and paleontology, <coughs> which has stayed with me pretty much the rest of my life. It's what I went on to university to study, study and has led me to become a teacher. But being a geek, uh, and as geeks do, we wonder about the, the funny details in these sort of films. And I always thought, that if they ever got Jurassic Park up and running, how would they clean the dinosaur's teeth? I mean, they're going to get really bad breath. Really bad breath. And it's not like you can just pull out the sort of standard Colgate and a toothbrush to clean a dinosaur's teeth. I mean, a T-Rex tooth, you're talking like this. Ginormous, by about that. Okay, and it has hundreds of them in its mouth, so how do you do it? Well, the toothbrush issue isn't such a big deal. We can, we can sort that out, we can just get a, a really big brush, okay, and we can brush their teeth. But what do we use on their teeth? They're just, you know, putting this on there isn't going to do the job. So what I thought is, how could I, using some science and some chemicals, come up with my own dinosaur's toothpaste? So what I have here is a measuring cylinder. And inside this measuring cylinder is a chemical called potassium iodide. And I'm going <coughs> to add to it just some household washing up liquid. So this, this toothpaste is probably going to taste very nice, but these dinosaurs, they eat dead rotting meat, so I don't think they're going to care too much. Okay, nothing magical happens there. But I'm going to give it a really good shake because okay, I really need to mix that washing up liquid with that potassium iodide. <coughs> there we go, mixing it right up. Now, the final ingredient is a chemical that you may have around your homes, probably not in this type of form, but if any of your mums and dads here have ever dyed their hair, Okay, this chemical hydrogen peroxide is inside the dye they place in the hair. So again, this probably isn't going to make our toothpaste taste that great, but hopefully we should be able to get some toothpaste now if I add hydrogen peroxide to my already existing mix. <laughs> Dinosaurs. Toothpaste. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I'm not really Darth Vader. <laughs> <coughs> that was Star Wars. What a wonderful series of science fiction movies. I remember when I was a kid, kind of like the age that you are now, and all I wanted to do was travel around the galaxy just like Luke Skywalker. Set in a galaxy far, far away. Darth Vader's evil empire pursuing the heroic rebel alliance across the galaxy in a desperate fight of good against evil. So, how did these giant spaceships that pursue the rebels get around the galaxy? How can they accelerate to prepare for the jump to light speed? Well, quite simply, they use rocket thrusters. And here I have in my hands some rocket thrusters. Inside these <coughs> rocket thrusters is rocket fuel. Now, if I turn them upside down and ignite them, they will go flying all around the room. And sadly, I'm not allowed to do that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put these on the floor. <coughs> we're going to develop some thrust. <coughs> and for safety reasons, they're going to push into the floor and hopefully not fly around the room. So 
So what we're going to do is get my wonderful assistant Emily here to light my tapers. So I'm going to stand back a little bit. And we'll get to see just how much thrust can be developed from a small rocket thruster. Oh no! Now, if you're being pursued across the galaxy, do make sure your rockets work. So might I suggest, if Darth Vader's chasing you around, you get yourself some rockets, and that will help you escape. <laughs> Who loves Doctor Who? Yeah, I mean, you can tell. I actually dress like this every day. This is just my normal dress. I'm not joking, I generally is. I absolutely adore Doctor Who. And the thing I love about Doctor Who is that, unlike other heroes in action films and stuff, which solve all their problems with guns and violence, which, you know, it's okay, it's not a place, but the Doctor is a hero that solves his problems with his mind. Okay, he's, he's working things through, he's coming up with solutions. And as scientists, that's what we love. We want to solve things with our mind and not have to resort to violence. The thing I love the most about the Doctor is his sonic screwdriver. Okay? And being a complete Doctor Who geek, of course, I have my own sonic screwdriver, <laughs> which also I use in my lessons as well. And the sonic screwdriver is amazing. It has amazing powers. It can... Unfortunately, you can hear it very well, but in that video, it can re-atomise doors, it can reprogram any computer, it can read anything, it can change anything. It's absolutely fantastic. And you know, there's no bullets or anything. It's just, it's just amazing. So what I thought I'd do is I'd demonstrate some of the power that a sonic screwdriver has right here for you today. So what I've got here, and I just need the audience just to confirm a few things <coughs> for me. Okay. Can you just have a look at now? I've got a, a, a beaker there of empty oil. Can you just say... Can't see anything inside there? Good stuff. Just empty oil. Anyone can see that? Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. And the other thing I have is a standard laboratory test tube. Okay? Now you want to give that a flip for me? Just confirm that's real glass. Real glass? Yeah, good. Flick. Good stuff. Real? Good stuff. Okay. Now, I'm not in a habit of smashing up my own lab equipment. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this test tube and I'm going to smash it into bits. <coughs> you can generally hear I'm smashing it, no, no tricks here. Okay, just to, I'll try not to spill any floor, as we have a hobbit in the house and he doesn't wear any shoes. <coughs> okay, all broken? Yeah. Broken? Okay, guys, can you see down here all broken? Yep, yeah, broken glass. Yeah? Over the last? Okay, good stuff. Right, now, using the power of my sonic screwdriver, I'm going to attempt to put all the atoms of that test tube back together and hopefully see if we can fix the reckless damage I've just caused to my test tube. So, pour carefully into and hopefully power of my sonic. A bit more? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. A lot of atoms to re, re put together there. Okay, good stuff. Hopefully.
think I uh, draw this, drew this short score slightly, being barefoot on a cold night and uh, going after the one with the smashed test tube, which is uh, probably not the best idea, but there you go. Uh, the clip you've just seen uh, was a cut from several of the films, and the last of the Hobbit, Hobbit films is actually coming out this week in cinema. And it's one of my favourite series as a whole. It tells the story of, a, of a, the rings forged to help lead the men, the elves, and the dwarves. But a secret ring was forged, one that was there to rule all others. And that was done by the Emperor Sauron. And his intentions were to spread evil and hatred throughout the land. And it came to pass that during an epic battle of elves, men, and dwarves, that he was killed. And the ring was taken. And it was supposed to be destroyed, but unfortunately it never was. It was lost. It was found by a hobbit called Bilbo, which was then passed to his nephew, Frodo. Now, during his journey, which was epic, he travelled from one side of Middle-earth to another. And he met many dangers. And one of those, which you've just seen, was the giant spider Shelob in the Shadow Mountains. Who in here likes spiders? A lot of few people. A lot of few people. Most people would say that they don't particularly like spiders. And having seen that giant spider there, it got me thinking. Is the making of the web, is it magic or is it just some science? So I went out and I took some, well, I, I asked Sheila very nicely if I could have some of the chemicals that she used to make her web. So I'm going to try today <coughs> to make some of her web. Now you can see here, these people on the front rows here, okay, and maybe at the back, you can see I've got one liquid. So if I pour that liquid into this beaker here, and I take the second liquid, as you can see, and I pour it just down the side. And using these tweezers, I should hopefully be able to make my spiders wet. And I've got Frodo here, and I can wrap Frodo in his spider's web. Now I'm going to try that again, because it seems to, oh there we go, that's better. If I start wrapping Frodo in his spider's web, all of that from two liquids. Hang on a minute. Hang on. I don't like spiders. Do anyone, do, did anyone else not like spiders? Good. See, I think I've got more people on my side here. Now, so when I saw that scene, I was focused much more on Samwise Gamgee to try and scare the spider away. And I think I've come up with the right chemicals. That bottle was given to Samwise by the Elven Queen. Okay? And using my scientific skills, I think I've worked out what the chemicals are. This one, which is called Lim Lumino, and this one, which is elven blood. Okay? So, let's see if this works. Can we please dim the lights? Bit more, bit more, bit more. Let's hope it works. There we go. Let him go! <laughs> so, as you can see, if you ever come across a giant spider, all you need is a bit of chemistry and possibly some elven blood. <laughs> Hogwarts is an amazing place full of wonder and magic. Scientists like to think of magic as simply science that is waiting to be explained. When we see something that looks like magic, we question, investigate, and try to explain how and why it happens. Like the wizards of Hogwarts, the science teachers at Crestwood have special skills and expertise. Uh, Mr. Neil is a master of the dark arts with his knowledge of dinosaurs, rocks, and fossils. Mr. Owens is master of the seas with his knowledge of marine animals like sharks. And Miss Bax is our master of the dark arts with her knowledge of the dead and forensic science. I could be considered a master of the elements. Let me show you. Take this flask here. Here we have a clear liquid, water. Okay, using my training and science knowledge, I can cast a spell which will change the colour of this liquid. Convertioso spectrum. I will add this potion 
and you can tell me which colours you can see. Okay, as I shake this, I'll come round and show you. Okay, so what colour do we have here? Green. Green. Now if I shake it a bit harder, and keep shaking, keep shaking, can you tell me when you can see a different colour? Is it changing yet? Is it changing? Keep watching really, really closely. I'll come over this side. Now what colour do we have? Yellow and brown. Is it changing anymore? If I shake it any harder, can we get any different colours? Nearly. Orange. Okay, and finally almost a red colour. Okay, now that was um, quite a simple <coughs> spell. Okay, now... Um, what we're going to do is actually I need your help for the next one. Okay, so you're going to help me to cast a spell. Okay, so, so repeat after me. <coughs> Convertioso spectrum. Convertioso spectrum. That wasn't very good. Let's have it a bit louder. Repeat after me. Convertioso spectrum. Convertioso spectrum. That was a bit better. That might work. Fingers crossed. Okay, so after a hard day of teaching, uh, all of the students at Hogwarts, Professor Dumbledore likes to relax with a nice glass of wine. Okay, and the teachers of Presswood like to do the same. <laughs> so here I have a bottle of Hogwarts finest wine. Okay, so I pour it out for you. You can see Hogwarts wine in glass one. There we go. Lovely ready purple colour. But actually, I do think it's a little bit early for us to be drinking any wine. Okay, so you guys are going to help me to cast a spell, and we can turn this wine into a nice, refreshing glass of water. Are you ready? Okay, Convertioso Spectrum. There we go. Nice, refreshing glass of water. Okay, well actually, I'd like something a little bit more filling. Okay, so I would like us to cast our spell again, and this time turn the wine into milk. Are you ready? Convertioso spectrum. There we go, let's have a look if we can get some. Whoa. There we go. <laughs> okay, so here we do, we do have a nice glass of milk. Okay, next. Milk's a bit bland, water's a bit bland. Okay, so why don't we have a bit more flavour in there? Let's do the spell again, and this time, fingers crossed, we're hope for some raspberry milkshake. Okay, I'm sure you all love raspberry milkshake. Are we ready? Convertioso spectrum. Let's have a look. Oh, there we go. That's a lovely colour. It's nice and tasty. Some raspberry milkshake. Actually, after all that, I'm really, really thirsty. So I'd like a refreshing glass of soda. Okay, so one more time with the spell. Convertioso spectrum. Let's have a look if we can get some fizzy soda in here. Whoa, there we go. Okay, so nice fizzy water, nice and refreshing. But actually, after casting that spell so many times, I think I'd actually like a nice glass of wine. So let's try again. Let's one more time, just turn it back into the Hogwarts wine. Convertioso Spectrum. Let's see what we can get. And there we go. Cheers. How many people have seen Back to the Future? Yeah. Oh, good, good. I was well, didn't expect to have seen it. Actually, being quite an old movie, absolutely adore it. One, two, and three, but especially the first one. It's got everything that you need in a movie. It's timeless. It's got mad professors with wild hair. It's got time travel. It's got DeLoreans. It's got hoverboards. It's, it's just simply amazing stuff. And we all here absolutely love it. Which is why we kind of wanted to finish up with that movie as our final um, uh, thing of the night, final part of the show. Now, in that scene you saw, that's a pivotal moment, it's the climax of the movie. Mad scientist Doc Brown in 1950s is trying to send Marty McBride back to 1985 in the time machine. And to do it, he needs the power of a lightning bolt. 
Uh, and, and that sort of power is 1.21 gigawatts of power. Now, to put that in perspective, to generate that power nowadays, you need about 484 wind turbines, or something maybe a bit more impressive, if you had a hamster wheel, and your hamster was running around the hamster wheel hooked up to a generator, you'd need 8 billion of them spinning around to generate that type of power. So it's, it's a large amount, okay? But power stations generate that every day. Now, here at Crestwood, we unfortunately can't generate the type of electricity that's needed to send a DeLorean in time, unfortunately. I wish we could, but we can't. But we can generate quite a significant amount of electricity using this machine right here. And this is called a Van de Graaff generator. It was developed uh, in the uh, early 19th century by a guy called Robert Van de Graaff, American physicist, to investigate static electricity. And to help me demonstrate some of the powers <coughs> of this machine, some of the impressive things you can do with this machine, I'll just ask the rest of my science department to come out and give me a hand. <coughs> so the way this machine works is it's quite a simple premise. Underneath the dome here, there's a rubber belt that the motor will spin around and around, and it's rubbing against this metal plate here, you can see it at front, and that causes friction which builds up an ch electrical charge in the dome. Now, in Back to the Future, Dot wants to channel a lightning bolt. Now, I can't bring in a huge lightning bolt into this room, but I can bring in mini lightning bolts. So I'm just going to turn the machine on, and if we could just have the lightning bolt down for me, please. I'm going to show you how, using this uh, rod here, which is connected to the uh, earth, we can create mini lightning bolts using Van de Graaff. And that is about 450,000 volts of electricity running from the dome through to the rod. Now, to show you a slightly more impressive use of the Van de Graaff generator, I'm going to hand over to Neil McLeod. Thank you. Mr. Neil. No. In Back to the Future, in one of the movies, Maxim McFly's got a hoverboard. Now, if you were like me when you were a teenage kid, one thing you would love to have is a hoverboard. Unfortunately, we cannot go to the shops at the moment and buy hoverboards to go and scooting around in the streets. But I'm going to demonstrate a principle. And perhaps in this room tonight, there's a young scientist who might figure out how we can harness the high voltage electricity here and maybe develop a hoverboard to help you float off the ground. Could be you. Thank you, thank you, Neil. Um, so impressive, we've done bolt, lightning bolts from the clock tower. We've just looked how we could theoretically. I think a hoverboard probably weighs a bit more than a tin cup, but um, we can we can at least get them to lev levitate anyway. <coughs> now, I said 450,000 volts. Who thinks that's a dangerous amount of electricity? Yeah, it could be. It could be. The best thing about a band buffer, although the voltage is high, the current, which is what actually causes you harm, is very, very low. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Stuart Owens, who's going to talk you through how we can actually channel those 450,000 volts into people. Now, obviously, as Miss Neil has just said, you, the amount you hear is, sounds quite dangerous. And although it's a large number, there is a way we can channel it through people. And I've got a rather reluctant volunteer who's going to help me out. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this doll on top of the Van der Graaff generator. Now, those people who have seen Back to the Future, there's lots of iconic things about it. There's a flux capacitor, there's a DeLorean, and there's lots of other things. But one of the most iconic things is the dock and his hair, and his crazy hair. Okay, so I'm going to turn this on, and we're going to have a look. And what I want you to do is concentrate <coughs> on Barbie's hair. Slowly, if you can see that, slowly her hair is starting to stand on end. So as the electricity travels through the Van der Graaff generator into the Barbie, it goes up and into the hair. Now, if I take this and I make my lightning bolts, you can actually see, can everyone see the hair drop slightly? 
Now, that's pretty impressive. But, you didn't come here to see me do that with a Barbie. Instead, I think we should get a real person to have a go at this. Now, unfortunately, I can't get people up from the audience, unfortunately. However, due to Miss Vax, Katie scaring away Shelob earlier, why don't I get her to come up and give me a hand? Why don't we give her a round of applause? Yeah. Now, Katie will jump up onto these two boxes here, and these are to insulate her. Electricity wants to get to the ground. And that's what it wants, it wants to get to us. So these insane boxes will stop, <coughs> will stop it getting to the earth. So could you please place your hands on the expander rock generator? And move this out of the way so you don't get the shot from there. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it on. And as I turn it on, what's going to happen is the electricity is going to come through the expander rock generator into Miss Bax, but it's not going to shock her, we hope. <laughs> and it shouldn't reach the ground, which means that we shouldn't get any shocking at all. Is that working? Yeah, definitely working. I let the board. Fortunately, the table, bottom of the table, is made of metal, so. Can we all see that? Can you see that hair starting to stand on end? Now, I'm going to stop in a minute because I don't want to put too much electricity in. In fact, she does have to come in and see it tomorrow. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to do, turn this off. And then what I'd like you to do, because at the moment the electricity is still travelling through Ms. Bax, so what she's going to do is she's going to do something called discharging the electricity. So what she's going to do is she's going to take her left hand and place it onto the table, the wood, not the metal. <laughs> then she's going to take her right hand and put it on the table. And then finally, I'm just going to make sure there's no more electricity running through this. And there we go. So we're going to have a round of applause for Miss Baxter. <laughs> okay, a really impressive machine. Which we, we, if you come to press for uh, next year or the year after, you will get to have a go at this machine. We're allowed to do it in the science laboratories, we just can't do it here. Um, so, very, very impressive. And that's the end of our film section. But we thought, as it's Christmas, and it's a Christmas lecture, Okay, we'd end on a Christmassy note. And you may have noticed that after each of the uh, experiments that we've done, as we've walked off stage, we've poured a clear liquid into this Christmas tree. And this is a very sciencey Christmas tree anyway, okay? It, it, it's very geeky. But it's got the standard things you'd expect from a, a Christmas tree. It's got tinsel and it's got baubles. And it's even got lights, which I will turn on shortly. But it's lacking something. It's lacking the sciencey bit that we really want. Now... In this beaker here, I've got seven pipettes filled with a solution called Universal Indicator. So I'm going to need seven volunteers from the audience, please, to come up. Special type of Christmas tree. We call it a chemistry. <laughs> okay, this brings us to the end of the show. Um, before we go, um, I just want to say some thank yous to people who have made this possible. Emily, my student helper. Uh, uh, Ryan on lighting. Uh, Emily on camera for us tonight. And a massive thank you to my science department. I'm very lucky to have such a wonderful, talented uh, teaching science department. And, um, you know, they've helped me out to put this show together as it was my crazy idea at the start of the year. And they've all given up their time to do it. So can we give them a big round of applause? <laughs> okay, so from all of us here at Crestwood, we'd like to wish you a very, very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I hope to see most of you or some of you in uh, next year's Year 7 or the following Year 7 where you get to carry out all these fun science practicals. So please have a safe journey home. From all of us here, good night. Thank you. Thank you.